Welcome and good afternoon. Um, my name is Itzhak Melamed, and I'm a scholar of early modern philosophy and a professor of philosophy at Johns Hopkins University. Um, the topic of today's talk is a certain event that happened to uh, happen. Well, more than happened. We'll see what, what does it mean, what, what was it. But a certain event in the middle of the life of a philosopher named uh, Benedict de Spinoza. Now, before I get into the talk itself, I just want to thank the team of people who are working in preparation of this talk, and those are Vicky, Hannah, uh, Samantha, and Hero. They did amazing work over the past couple of days, and I just wanted to express my gratitude. Um, you are very welcome to send questions uh, during the talk, and we'll have a long session, hopefully, of uh, about 20 minutes of uh, Q&A towards uh, after the talk. So uh, please feel free to send them through chat and the team will basically uh, channel them to me. Uh, I'll try to finish my talk around 12.40 so that you will have plenty of time to discuss uh, any questions you might have. Okay, so who is Spinoza? Spinoza is one of the greatest philosophers of all time. Well, I, I'm not going not to say that, I have to say that. But uh, he's one of the greatest metaphysicians uh, in the history of philosophy. I think together with Aristotle are probably the most, uh, the two most influential metaphysicians. Uh, he is an important ethicist. His major book uh, called Ethica or Ethics uh, is an attempt to uh, explain human nature and try to draw a path towards a uh, life-fulfilling uh, way of conduct. And uh, he's also a systematic thinker. We won't have much time to discuss this last feature of, of the, his wor work, meaning the systematicity, although it's quite important, but we might have some occasion to address those uh, in the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, now, what we're going to do today is just to zoom in on one event in Spinoza's life, it's a ben, or cherem in Hebrew, that was pronounced by the lay leader of the Portuguese Jewish community of Amsterdam in July 19, and July 1656. We probably even know the precise date. I mean, there, although there is some, uh, some unclarity here, but it's minor. What's important is that Spinoza came from a community of Jews who were former conversos. The conversos were Jews who were living in Portugal and uh, Spain in the 15th century. And by the end of the 15th century, they were forced to convert to Christianity. Throughout the 16th century, they were living uh, as Christians, at least in terms of external behavior, but they were keeping some Jewish customs uh, quietly and, and in a way that will not uh, be too salient. By the early 17th century, some of them immigrated to Amsterdam where they returned to Judaism, uh, but they were learning to be Jews. And for them, that was not such a simple task. I mean, they wanted to understand what, what does it mean? And we might have some opportunity to discuss the, the specific circumstances, the specific um, mentalities that is developed as a result of that. It's a community that on the one hand is very rich and has power in terms of po uh, political power, but it is very unusual in terms of, um, well, its customs and also pretty anxious about trying to set boundaries about uh, what is what is permitted and what is not permitted. That's just uh, in terms of giving some background. Now, the title of the talk is basically a kind of equivocation because I'm not going to say that uh, Spinoza was never put on a ban. There was an event, it was a ban, but when I'm saying that Spinoza was not excommunicated, I will argue, and you'll see it in a few minutes, that it's a pretty mis misleading uh, claim to describe this event as an excommunication. It's something else. It's a harem, and the identification of harem with, uh, with excommunication is actually uh, pretty wrong. I mean, I'll try to convince you about that. The second point, where, where you, which uh, uh, you can draw from the title of this talk, is that uh, well, we don't really know what are the reasons for the excommunication of Spinoza, or 
sorry, I'll correct myself, for the Herem on Spinoza. Um, during the talk, we'll discuss some common, perhaps popular explanations that you'll find uh, for the Herem on Spinoza. Uh, and I think that they are actually quite problematic. Uh, at the very end of the talk, I'll gesture at some interesting information that came up uh, that basically was published over the past 15, 20 years, which may be uh, giving us a good hint towards the actual reasons. I'm not sure about it. It's quite speculative, but I'll, I'll, I'll just gesture that. So we have a, we, we have a long uh, way to go. So let's first of all start up, uh, uh, with doing our work. So generally, what I want to say is that uh, I'm, what I'll try to do here is some sort of a joint study. I mean, uh, as you could see, many of my conclusions are pretty tentative. I mean, I think I know what is not the case, but I'm not 100% sure about what is the case. So the plan will be in the first part, in half a second, we are going to discuss the relationship between Helm and excommunication. The second part, uh, will briefly encounter the common legend about why was Spinoza excommunicated and what was this kind of excommunication. The second part, uh, the third part, we're going to discuss uh, closely the one text we have, which is the actual ban on Spinoza, the actual harem, and see what we can get from this text. I think that the, the text itself is extremely important, and so we'll spend a little bit more time just in reading it carefully and seeing what precisely is going on there. In the fourth part, I'll discuss three common explanations that were suggested for the Herem, for the reasons for the Herem, and I'll, I'll try to convince you all, I'll try to explain why I think that each of these explanations is not very, um, uh, not very convincing. The final point of the talk will be some sort of another spoiler, which is, um, you know, we normally would expect Spinoza being a kind of a liberal thinker, and he is liberal thinking, liberal thinking to be perhaps critical of excommunication or critical of Herem. He's not. Actually, he thinks it's a perfectly legitimate uh, measure of the uh, church. It, only, the only thing is that it should be supervised uh, by the state. So we'll, we'll come to that towards the end of the talk and we, you can see, uh, you can make uh, your own judgment and, and your own impression. So let's begin with the first part. Um, so harem versus excommunication. The concept and the practice of harem has been poorly studied so far. In fact, um, the, most, uh, the most comprehensive uh, attempt to understand the practice of Herem and the concept of Herem has been actually at Hopkins about four years ago. We organized a, uh, a conference on the theory and the practice of Herem, uh, which, as, as a matter of fact, um, brought us so, so many things that were um, unexpected. I mean, so there, you know, we have a, some sort of an image, and then once we are trying to look at it and see how it is practiced in one place, how it is practiced in another, the stories that turned out to be 10 times much more complex than anything you'd, you'd think. But uh, there are hardly any, currently there are hardly any studies of the development of the concept of Herem in rabbinic writing. And with the exception of uh, Yosef Kaplan's meticulous work on the practice of Herem in early modern Amsterdam, we know very little about how rabbinic theorizing of Herem has been applied in various historical contexts. So again, we have the issue of the theory itself not very clear, at least uh, we don't, I mean, in English, you have hardly any scholarship. And then you have also the question of how this theory was implemented. Okay. The situation is especially disturbing in the English literature on, on the Hermann Spinoza because many of the scholars who recently wrote on this issue seems to have no access to rabbinic sources. And as a result, they did not even consult the few existing studies of the issue in prime, and primary sources. Uh, the, the most comprehensive study of the theory of Herem uh, can be found in uh, the Encyclopedia Talmudica, but again, you hardly find any English source citing uh, that pretty central study. So for us, the question is, is it legitimate to translate Herem as excommunication? 
So what I would like to do here is to raise a few preliminary doubts for the purpose of simplicity, the person that I'm going to draw uh, would be between, uh, the person I'm going to draw would be between uh, harem and excommunication as practiced in uh, Roman Catholicism, though uh, excommunication is present also in Protestant denominations, but you know we, in order to, to work in a kind of a more neat manner, I'll, I'll just take the, the Catholic model, which I think is probably quite significant. So let's try to compare harem against excommunication in terms of, well, six main features. So here's well, the first feature. The essential effect of excommunication is withdrawal of, sac of sacraments. There is nothing remotely similar in the case of harem. So harem is a ban. Uh, and it, it prohibits some social contact between uh, one person in the Jewish community and the rest. But because there are hardly any sacraments within the rabbinic context, so there is no withdrawal of sacraments because uh, it's, it, they, they are not there. Um, second point, uh, excommunication does not require social isolation. So someone can be on... Uh, can, can be excommunicated, uh, and to that extent, he, that person would not be allowed to uh, take part in the sacraments, but he would not be under any kind of uh, uh, restrictions of, of social contact. In the harem, this limitation on social contact are actually quite essential. Third point, um, excommunication must be issued by the church authority. Specifically, it must be issued by the bishop, either the bishop in whatever town you find, or the bishop of Rome, meaning the pope. Cherem was frequently, and I would argue mostly, issued by the lay leaders, not by the rabbis. Now, the interesting story is that, it, just to give you an example, one, one of the bizarre um, side, side stories of, of the stories of Cherem is that um, in Amsterdam, um, the rabbis tried to grab the authority. They were, some of the rabbis were trying, specifically a person by the name of Menashe Ben Israel, um, was trying to grab power and basically asking that he, as the main rabbinic figure of the community, would be allowed to announce a harem. Well, what happened at that point? Well, uh, the answer is he himself was put on harem, and after two days, uh, he withdrew his, uh, uh, his from the fight and he was reinstated into his own his old position and everything was fine. So again, who what in, in Amsterdam we know actually a, the list of, of leading rabbinic figures who were put on her is actually quite long. I mean, I'm not going to bug you with that, but it's a, it's a very impressive list of some of the most important rabbinic figures. Um, uh, in Western Europe. Okay, fourth point, uh, harem can be reflexive, meaning a person can put himself on harem. So a person can tell, can say that I'm as a punishment or as an act of, I don't know, of, of, uh, uh, of um, uh, ascesis. I mean, a person can come and say, I'm prohibited from being in the company of certain people. I'm prohibited from doing X and Y and Z. That's count within a rabbinic framework as a harem. By contrast, there is nothing like self-excommunication in the Catholic context. Let's go next. So we're speaking, well, let's talk about the, what are the reasons for the harem. Oh, yeah. So the rejection of dogma or principles of faith is a common reason for excommunication. Rejection of dogma was rarely a reason for harem. Why it was rarely? Because, well, there was hardly ever really dogmas within rabbinic Judaism. It's not because they were more open, but rabbinic Judaism never developed anything remotely similar to principles of faith. I mean, there were a few attempts, there were colossal failures. So if, if anyone would like to discuss it, I'll be happy to address these issues in the Q&A. Um, final point, excommunication is never local. Meaning, if uh, once the church announces excommunication, Catholic and it's, it's 
it's valid all over. That's not the case with harems. I mean, someone can be put on harem in one synagogue, crosses the street to another one. In this synagogue, I am not put on harem. Uh, so the, the, the universality of these practices is very different. Now, in light of all of these differences, uh, I think we should, uh, we should, well, noting these differences, we should not deny some similarities between harem and excommunication. So uh, both of them are social measures attempting to create, um, uh, to, to, uh, to enforce norms uh, that are semi-violent, I would say, and uh, they are related to social distancing, right? Still, I would argue that harem and excommunication are at best first or second cousins rather than twin siblings. And we should not associate them too closely in order not to mislead scholars not familiar with the characteristics of harem in their rabbinic context and just think, oh, so that's what harem means. Well, no. I mean, it's important that, you know, try to understand each culture according to its own norms and don't impose norms of one culture on another. Um, so having thus noted that Spinoza was put on harem rather than being excommunicated, let me now turn to discuss some un unlikely reasons for the harem. So as we said, an event happened, but let's see what is the, and there was, the, but next to this event, there is a whole legend that was going around it. And it's not easy to try to see and find out precisely what is the factual core of the event and what belonged to the just the level of legend that were added uh, later into the story. Okay, so during the 18th and 19th century, the story of Spinoza's excommunication was frequently cited by European writers as proof of the cultural inferiority and backwardness of the Jews. Uh, let me read one source, uh, an excellent philosopher called uh, uh, Hegel. So, uh, Hegel is writing, uh, this text is from his lectures on the history of philosophy, so I think it should be from the 1820s, and he, here's the text, he's saying, his youth Spinoza was instructed by the rabbis of the synagogue to which he belonged, but he soon fell, uh, uh, f he soon fell out with them, uh, their wrath having been kindled by the criticism which he has, be uh, which he has passed on the fantastic doctrine of the Talmud, the rabbi offered him a, a, day, a yearly allowance of a thousand gulden if he would keep away from the synagogue and hold his tongue, but he refused. So basically, you know, you, you have the figure, you, you have the uh, Jewish rabbinic figures that are, you know, uh, uh, fantastic or, or fanatics or, or something, or something of that sort. And uh, this story is a story of, you know, an abuse by uh, a cultural inferior. Uh, group of people. Um, this story was slightly, I mean, I think you find echoes of this story all over the 18th and 19th century, just literally every, every almost every other source that you, that you will read in the 18th, 19th century. More recently, we find some slightly uh, more nuanced version. So uh, because Spinoza became a cultural hero, and I understand why, I mean, I I share this cult, if you wish, uh, I may say, but um, uh, so Spinoza became the subject of two recent uh, plays, one in Israel, in Hebrew, by Yeshua Sobel, Solo, and Sobel charges the rabbis, I mean, here's the twist, he charges rabbis rather than the Jews in general with fanaticism and intolerance. Now, he might be right, but let's first of all look at the text and see what was going on there. And then, um, I, I, a play that you might be much more familiar with is David E. Vest, New Jerusalem, 2009. So he is, I mean, you know, there, there is some element of PC in his presentation of the story. So he places the guilt on the Amsterdam city authorities who are described as pressing the Jewish community to, cut, to cast out the damned heritage. The narratives of both planes are highly ideological. Actually, if you read them, you'll see much many echoes of uh, of what is happening in New York or in the US in 2009 and what is happening in Israel in 1991. And they really have much more to do with the political reality of the playwrights rather than with that of Spinoza, but they have the core legend, 
which is the legend about Spinoza, that, which you find in popular narrative. And the legend is roughly saying Spinoza was banned by the rabbis due to, to his heretical espousal of atheism, pantheism, and his denial of the eternity of the human mind. Now, again, this version, I think you'll find in dozens, if not hundreds of textbooks. It's wrong. Let me try to explain to you why I think it's wrong. So in order to make this case, uh, what we need to do is just, first of all, look at the text of the, of the harem itself. So let's, if you have some patience, just let's look at the, it won't take much time, but I would like to read with you some lines from this text because it's, it's interesting. It making, uh, and there are some um, crucial points uh, that must be uh, noted about, uh, about this document. So uh, we have the text now, the original text is in Portuguese. Here we have the, uh, an English translation, the senores of the Mahamad, meaning the leaders uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Jewish, the lay leaders of the Jewish community, having long known of the evil, opi evil opinions and acts of Baruch de Spinoza, pay attention to the combination of opinions and acts. Right, it's absolutely important that we'll have these two elements coming together. We'll see it stressed again in a few minutes. They have endeavored by various means and promises to turn him from his evil ways, but having failed to make uh, to make him mend his wicked uh, his wicked ways, and on the contrary, daily receiving, okay, a minute, daily receiving, um, um, receiving more and more serious information about the abominable heresies which he practiced and taught and about his monstrous deeds, deeds they, uh, and then the text continues to tell us that they, were, they uh, consulted trustworthy witnesses. There, there was a whole, the bottom line is there was a whole process there. Uh, they tried to get the information, they got some information, the information was established by asking reliable witnesses and stuff of that sort. The important thing, I think, is, uh, well, there are many important things, but one thing which is absolutely central here is that there is a strong stress about the combination of deeds and opinions. You see here Spinoza is speaking about, um, uh, Spinoza, I'm sorry, the, the text is speaking about uh, abominable heresies on the one hand, and it is important that there are any his monstrous deeds, right? So what, what is this kind of combination of deeds what are specifically these things and how the deeds are related to the heresies, okay? Now, this is the beginning of the, of the text of the, um, of the excommunicate, of the, uh, of the ban. Uh, the rest is actually slightly more, slightly less interesting to my mind because it's, it, pre it is pretty much standard. What is happening afterwards is just a list of curses, uh, Pretty strong, uh, and they are found in many uh, bands, in many bills of, of harem uh, against other figures. And what we are, um, what uh, uh, the, the reason for this um, uh, for this curse is, is that the function of the harem is just to frighten the person, to put him, uh, to try to convince him to recount. And there is. One way you can use uh, the threat of force and isolation as part of the harem, but then the possibility just you have threats of curses. I mean, you know, what will happen to you? Not by human beings, but perhaps by God or stuff of that sort. Um, now, uh, some people were strongly impressed by this list of curses. I'm not, and I'll explain in half a second why I was not impressed. Before we go there, just I want to draw your attention to just one word, and that's the word which is translated in English here is excommunicate. So here's the text is saying, by decree of the angels, and by the command of the holy man, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a ritual, it's a ritual, a ritualistic formula. We excommunicate. Now, the interesting thing is that you don't use the word of excommunication in the original Portuguese. Instead, you see you're, the, the Portuguese word is now, it's not a Portuguese word, it's actually Yiddish Portuguese. What happens there is that they take their word cherem and decline it according to the rules of uh, Portuguese, right? 
So they basically take the, the Hebrew concept of harem, they do not, the interesting point is that they do not translate it immediately to excommunication, but they're trying to say, no, no, it, that's, that's what we are doing. We're putting someone in harem and what you have here is a word that is just uh, translating the notion of harem into Portuguese, but again, using still the Hebrew word. Okay, so, when this event happened, so as far as we know, uh, we, well, we know that we, we have the, the text of the Cherem, and so we know that it happened on the sixth day of the Jewish month of Av, 1656. So uh, because the Jewish day begins at the night before the equivalent, um, um, uh, uh, equivalent general uh, day in the general calendar, so it should be either Wednesday, July 26th or Thursday, July 27th. It's unlikely to be the night, meaning of July uh, 26th, because usually, um, well, you, slightly more in the story, sorry, a little bit more nuanced. Usually uh, uh, meetings of courts, rabbinic courts are not supposed to be at night. Now, the important thing is that here the action is not the action of the rabbis, but rather it's an action of the lay leaders. Are they functioning in some way as a court? Probably not. Still, again, it's not likely to happen at night. I mean, perhaps it's possible July 26th. I mean, the night begins in the Netherlands probably pretty late, but uh, most likely I think that the event uh, took place in July 27th. So what, is, what you, one thing which you see is that the harem was announced by the lay leaders, and again, not by the rabbis. The rabbis are basically um, giving their assent, but they're not the people who are, are actually, uh, they don't seem to instigate the investigation, and they are not really uh, the people conducting also the investigation itself. That's at least what we get from the, from the text of the, of the harem. Um, now, the reason for the harem was, as we saw, a combination of monstrous deeds and abominable heresies. So it must be something that in some way combines these two elements. And I think it's also important that uh, the, the text mentioned the fact that Spinoza taught uh, his abominable heresies. And of course, you can see now that there is a danger. I mean, there is an anxiety, not danger. There is anxiety about... Um, Spinoza being influential and perhaps drawing other people, which is obvious, uh, I think, from, from this day. Uh, what is interesting is that the nature of the deeds and, her and heresies is not spelled out in the document. I mean, they are horrible, they are monstrous, they are abominable, but what are they? Who knows? It, the, the, we, we are, I mean, it's so bizarre because three centuries after that, and so many people know about, and still we do not really know what was the reason for that. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, some scholars were highly impressed by the severity of the text rhetoric when it comes to the curses, right? That's a more ritualistic element. So let me quote, um, uh, well, a colleague of mine, a, a friend also, Stephen Nadler, Spinoza's heresy. So here's what uh, Nadler is saying. Mortera, Mortera was one, uh, Saul Mortera was one of the rabbis of the uh, of the community uh, of the Portuguese community in Amsterdam, and Motera received the appropriate text from the Venice chief rabbi, his former teacher Leon Modena. Modena, in turn, had adapted it from the late 13th century Compendium of Jewish Law and Customs, the Kolbo. Modena cobbled together a document full of curses and imprecations, one malediction after another. As far as we know, Modena's elaborate composition was brought out in the 17th century only for the banning of Spinoza. Well, again, uh, all I can say is that it's much ado about nothing. Uh, Modena did not contribute even one word to the formula of Spinoza's Cherem. Nothing. You take the entire text that we just read, uh, we, you've seen a minute ago, just look at that. Every word here uh, is a translation of a text which appears in this 13th century, 13th or 14th century, a manual called Kolbo. In fact, uh, the story is slightly more interesting because the text of the Kolbo, where you find all of the maledictions, it's far longer. 
So what Spinoza got was perhaps just 5% of the curses that are supposed to be in the full-fledged version. So in that sense, Spinoza or whatever, or the other people perhaps also in, in the Jewish community of Amsterdam, well, uh, they got a soft version. I mean, it, were you to get the full version that you find in Cole, but the story would be even long. I mean, it, I don't know. Uh, it, will, it will be even more juicy. Okay. Okay. So um, now let's see what are the common explanations for the ban on Spinoza. Okay. I have 10 more minutes. I'll try to make sure that I, uh, I'll, I'll be able to do everything I need within these 10 more minutes. So um, apart from the text, we have all kinds of stories that are interesting. Uh, there is one testimony which I want to draw your attention to. I mean, it's a testimony of, uh, uh, of a monk and a sailor, a captain uh, coming from, uh, from Spain, visiting Amsterdam, meeting Spinoza and a friend of his by the name of Juan de Prado. Uh, They're meeting them in a bar uh, after the uh, after they return, uh, after the uh, monk and the um, and uh, and the sailor return to Spain, uh, they give a deposition before the Inquisition, uh, and uh, the Inquis the, this deposition also describes their meeting with Spinoza and Juan de Prado. And here's what they're saying: Spinoza and Juan de Prado observed the Jew observed the Jewish law in the past. They changed their opinion once they realized that the law is not true. It, I think it's an important point, but question what you mean, that the soul dies with the body and that God does not exist. But only philosoph but God does not exist, but only philosophically, right? So what does it mean that God does not exist, but only philosophically, especially when this is coming from a philosopher like Spinoza? Well, I'll let you think about it. And that is why they have been expelled from the synagogue. Okay, now, should we trust this testimony? And I think, yes, we should. It's important, especially because we don't have so many sources right now. So we definitely should use them. But I think that we should always be somewhat suspicious about it because neither the monk nor the captain was a philosopher. And it is highly likely uh, that they could, uh, that, uh, uh, well, it is highly uh, likely that they could misinterpret some of the claims, especially. What, does, what, what do they mean when they're saying that Spinoza, a philosopher, believes in God, but only philosophically, right? So Spinoza, we know, had a very strongly anti-anthropomorphic conception of God. And this kind of conception of God that is not a God of providence, is not a God of compassion, is not a God of judgment, would most likely appear to the vulgus uh, as denying the existence of God. Uh, but actually, this kind of conception of God is also present in Maimonides, right? I mean, that's basically the view of Maimonides. Maimonides' God is probably just as anti-anthropomorphic as that of Spinoza. And so for some readers, this kind of conception will appear, well, it's a kind of conception of God, which is only philosophical, but is not God the policeman. Therefore, they are not serious about it. So I would, again, I, I think we should take this text seriously, but we should always um, try to understand precisely uh, who are the people who are delivering this information and, and how they would perceive this. So, given so gi given these uh, pieces of evidence, let's try to see what are the common explanations uh, for the ban on Spinoza. So, one explanation which you find many in many many texts is that that uh, uh, Spinoza was banned because he was a pantheist or an atheist. So while pantheism uh, is considered in many Christian denominations as, uh, as a heresy, and the assumption was, well, you know, it's a common heresy in the Judeo-Christian tradition or something like that, um, doesn't work. Why does it work? Well, sim very simple reason. Pantheism and panentheism was widely perceived as dangerous heresy in the early modern Latin West although there are exceptions to that as well, it did not have that reputation in the rabbinic context. It's almost the other way around. The mainstream of the Kabbalah is thoroughly pantheistic, and most of Spinoza's teachers, of Spinoza's teachers are filmed variants of pantheism or panentheism. So if you look, for example, at the two rabbis 
were consulted uh, uh, before the announcement of the uh, of the ban on Spinoza. Both of them are having plenty of pantheistic formulas claiming that God is the place where the entire world exists. God is everywhere. There is no place free from God. Um, pantheism and panentheism is not going to be a problem, as far as we know, uh, for Kabbalists. I mean, oh, again, it might, it might be an issue of debate, but, uh, but it's not going to be something that anyone would be, as far as we know, as anyone would be uh, uh, would, would be put on harem or uh, because of uh, such a claim. Then there is another suggestion, uh, and that's a suggestion made by uh, two scholars about 20 years ago. Their name is Asaf Asher and Shlomo Biderman. And their suggestion was that Spinoza was put on harem because he was interested in philosophy and became Cartesian. So according to the two, I read, Spinoza was excommunicated because he had been interested in Cartesian philosophy and ex had ex expressed his philosophical inclinations in public. Now, where does this come from? Well, um, there was debate within rabbinic circles from, I would say, uh, 11th, 12th century about philosophy and the study of philosophy. Uh, some people were for it, some people were against it. Um, but uh, the truth is that, as a matter of fact, uh, Amsterdam would be a very bad place uh, to put someone on harem because uh, he was interested in philosophy or because he was uh, engaged or interested in Cartesian philosophy. So why the Cartesian hypothesis is, is really highly unlikely. So here are a couple of considerations. So first of all, let's look at what are Descartes' views on God. Descartes' views on God are actually pretty extreme in terms of their conservatism. Descartes thinks that God actually can create everything. God can change the laws of logic. God can decide that two plus two equals five. God creates the eternal truth. Now, this is a view with a view like Descartes that was hardly acceptable by any medieval Jewish philosopher. For Maimonides, for example, the view that God can create the laws of logic is just crazy fanatic view that he thinks that there is no point in even discussing these views with, uh, with people with, with such fanatic views. Uh, there were figures in, in, in medieval philosophy who claimed that God can uh, change the laws of logic. El Ghazali was one of them, and he actually presents some really interesting and, and um, delicate defense of this view. But if you look at the philosophical views of, Spin of Descartes, for example, against Maimonides, Maimonides is far more of a heretic than Descartes. Now, in the 17th century, uh, Descartes was, uh, the Cartesianism more specifically, was uh, at some point was uh, subject of suspicion because some of the teachings of Descartes, especially his, uh, his criticism of, uh, of Aristotelian metaphysics, seemed to undermine the, uh, the notion of transubstantiation. Uh, and therefore, you cannot explain precisely what is happening uh, in the Eucharist. Uh, but that's not relevant to the case of, of uh, the rabbis in Amsterdam. So, uh, each of these rabbis, by the way, actually are also interested. Some of them are citing the card. I mean, without any kind of uh, of any kind of uh, 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 any kind of reservation. Now, second point: when you look at Spinoza's own writing from the very beginning, from the age, from the time that he is twenty-seven years old, he is strongly anti-Cartesian. The first letter we have of Spinoza, he is asked about his views about the card. Uh, by Henry Oldenburg, the secretary of the Royal Society in London. And his response is that Descartes is a wonderful philosopher, but have bad understanding of the, uh, of the cause of all things, a bad understanding of the nature of the human mind, and a bad understanding of the, of the causes of error, which is great philosopher, bad metaphysics, bad epistemology, uh, and, um, uh, and bad philosophy of mind. So, uh, and that's a guy who is, again, just to remind you, he's 27 years old, he's no one, and he's speaking about the most important philosopher in Europe at the time. Spinoza was not a good, good Cartesian, never, no, never at the beginning, never at the end. So that's not, I mean, to, I mean, uh, the text that I just cited to you, the letter is just a few years after the film. 
The third point is that uh, when Kasher and Biderman are trying to speak about bands resulting from the study of philosophy, again, it depends on it. So there were some bands, for example, in the 13th century, uh, in response to the pretty radical philosophy of Maimonides. The interesting story is that uh, there were bands against them. So uh, there was a ban, a ban on the study of philosophy, and there was a rabbinic ban against those who put a ban on the study of philosophy. So these kind of bands were working on both sides very nicely, and no one actually won the war, to be honest. But most important is that when you look at the when you look at the two fi two rabbinic figures involved here, so Saul Mortera and Itzhak Abuab de Fonesca, both of them are highly interested, highly sympathetic to medieval philosophy, to Aristotelianism. Basically, when you we have the list of the books in the library of Abuab. Uh, it contains the complete works of Aristotle, Averroes, Ibn Ezra, Gersonides, Wars of the Lord, Maimonides, Guide of the Perplexed. It's basically, you know, the, almost the canonic collection of Jewish radical Averroism or Jewish radical views. That's not a person that you would suspect of saying, oh, uh, you should not philosophy. He's studying philosophy himself. Pretty much the same also can be said about Saul Mortera, where he is you know, going around and bragging in one of the letters, one of his letters saying that uh, some of his students are superb metaphysicians, meaning he seems to be sympathetic to philosophy. So uh, neither Mortera nor Aboab, see, are, we, we have no evidence that either one of them was actually hostile to the study of philosophy. For all three reasons, I don't, for, for these three reasons, I don't see much um, uh, likelihood that, that the suggestion that Spinoza was put on the band because he studied philosophy. I mean, it doesn't seem to be the case. The third suggestion is, uh, was made by my uh, colleague and friend, Steve Nadler. And there the claim is that the main issue is the denial of, of immortality. It has some support from the testimony of the that we have just seen. Remember that we have seen this testimony by uh, the um, by the, um, um, the the two Spaniards that were uh, meeting Spinoza and Juan de Pareto. Now, uh, this being said, uh, it's important to point out that uh, the med ma major medieval rabbinic figures, and specifically, I'll say. Maimonides, Gersonides, and their disciples, and there is a huge camp here, had very unorthodox views about immortality. So over the centuries, the Maimonidean Avarician view of the soul as originating from the age and the intellect, or sometimes even originating from God, and after death, blending back to its heavenly source uh, after death, drifted into the mainstream. So this view became uh, pretty canonical. It became part of the um, of uh, liturgy in many cases, even if you look at the inscriptions on grave, on Jewish graves, there is a very strong allusion to this kind of view that after death, there is a unification with the God or the agent intellect. There is, that does not necessarily mean, actually it, mean, it, probably, mean, uh, it probably negates any kind of individual survival. So the, the survival of the individual after death, well, some people believed in that, but there is a whole huge camp of rabbinic figures who think that, well, after death, I mean, you're just going back to be identified, I mean, with God. Now, Spinoza himself develops a variant of the Maimonidian Averis view already in his early period, and he sticks to that till the end. So, uh, yes, it's true that he is belonging to this camp, but it's a camp that is, I would say, half of, of um, medieval rabbinic Jewish philosophers. Uh, now, second point or third point with regard to the uh, unlikelihood of this explanation is that bands related to dogma are extremely uncommon in the rabbinic context. So, uh, Yosef Kaplan uh, wrote a couple of fantastic studies about the bands in Amsterdam. And we know what are the, in, Amsterdam was the world capital in terms of, uh, of both in space and in time, in terms of bands or harems. And people were put on band for every possible reason that you can imagine. If you went to buy uh, meat 
at the butchery of this of the Ashkenazi community, you can be put on on harem. If you took a book from the library without returning it, you will be put on harem. If you are uh, not coming frequently enough to the to the synagogues, you can be put on harem. Now the list is crazy. I mean, the people were, would be put on harem in uh, in Amsterdam in one year more than you'll have uh, in other communities in three, four centuries. Uh, this being said, almost all of them are related to actions, not to opinions. It's not impossible that there will be uh, bans related to views or dogmas, but they are really not, not so common. I mean, we find very few of them. And the question is what happened precisely in, in the case of Spinoza. Final poll is that the immortality hypothesis provided no explanation of the monstrous deeds mentioned in the Cherem I mean, there should be some explanation why the Cherem is speaking about uh, horrible deeds. So what precisely are the horrible deeds that are related, um, that are related to, um, uh, to uh, the uh, abominable heresies that Spinoza was pursuing or, or believing in. Okay, uh, we're almost done. So, oops, I have another two minutes, so I'll do it very, very quickly. Um, just quick two points. So, uh, now you, you might be thinking, okay, that's a horrible thing. It's such a dark view, the use of, of um, uh, the use of bands. Well, in some sense, yes, but let me just try to give you also the other side. So first of all, uh, how about Spinoza himself? What does he think about bands in the use of excommunication? Well, he doesn't seem to have any opposition to that. Here's just a text, I mean, chapter 19 of the Theological Political Treatise. I read it to the review, but he's saying, he, here's what he's saying. Without the authority or permission of the supreme powers, the sovereign, no one has the right and power to, to administer these things, namely sacred matters, to choose a minister. So basically at that point, the argument in this space is that Spinoza wants all the functions of the state to be supervised, or all the functions of the church to be supervised by the state. And then he lists these major functions of the church. So here are the functions, choosing the ministers, determining and stabilizing the foundations of the church and its teaching, judging concerning morals and acts of piety, excommunicating someone or from or receiving someone into the church, nor finally to provide for the poor. So for Spinoza, excommunication is one of the basic and perfectly legitimate functions of the church, just like almsgiving or providing for the poor. In a well-run state, meaning in, a, in, in Spinoza's ideal state, the church should be subordinate to the political authorities. And Spinoza is a very strict Erastian. I mean, you think he's against separation of church and state because he thinks that the state should control the, the, the state should control the church. It's, it's a topic for another discussion. But excommunication is part of the fabric of the ideal society, even for Spinoza. So again, uh, here's what um, perhaps another way of looking at the, at what uh, at, at this practice. Final point. I mean, um, let's think about what precisely excommunication was doing. So excommunication um, is, is a political tool. It's also a semi-violent tool. Now, when we look at the history of Roman Catholicism, excommunication was used in a certain abusive manner, but it was also used for well-justified ends. So such as the enforcement and the prohibition on polygamy. I think that excommunication had a really important uh, role in that and the ban on the participation in duels. Um, now, in our times, bans or boycotts were used positively and responsibly in the fight against South, Amer South African apartheid and in the attempt to counter the power of the tobacco and gun industry. So social shaming, which is pretty much in the same family as bans and harems and, and excommunication, uh, is, is a tool. It's a semi-violent political tool. It is powerful and it's definitely subject to abuse, just like any other political measures. In some forms, the political sanctioned practice, uh, the politically sanctioned practice of banning or public shaming may perhaps be useful as an alternative to incarceration. So, you know, 
let's try to think for a second. Is incarceration much better than putting someone on ban or on heroin? I'm not sure. But with this quick note, uh, leaving perhaps more questions than answers, I'll be happy to uh, give to roll the the, the, uh, the ball back and uh, answer any questions you might have. So thanks. Oh, so here's a, I have a question from George. So was the outside attention pa paid to, uh, to criticism of Spinoza's views a, a fundamentally a form of anti-Semitism, a way to undermine perception of Jewish intellectual intellect more generally? Yes and no, it's a bit more, it's a complex story. Um, I mean, th there was an element there and there were also, of course, some Jewish writers who, who, who accused Spinoza of anti-Semitism. I think it's wrong, although there's some elements in Spinoza's writing about the Hebrews that were, I would say that are, I don't want to say imperfect, but they are imprecise. I mean, very, uh, but um, are, are this, uh, 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 is the construction of the story of uh, of the ban of the Herem and Spinoza anti-Semitic, it has some such elements. So I would say yes. Um, uh, does, so Mary is asking, does Spinoza's Herem reflect anything on the pol in the politics of that historical moment? Um, yes, of course. I mean, you know, it reflects on so many levels. I mean, um, you know, it, it's a, um, well, it's a politics of a community that is trying to reconstruct its identity. And therefore you see so many uses of harem or bands in order to, uh, in order to draw the boundaries of the community. Because why is it the case that this kind of extremely powerful wealthy community is using tens of, uh, tens, hundreds of, of, of harems just on the right and on the left in order to, um, in order to um, uh, make sure that people are going to abide by their uh, by uh, their regulations, so absolutely, I mean, there is uh, uh, the use of harem in 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 Spinoza's time in Amsterdam is definitely uh, a result of the local anxieties, uh, local attempts to establish and create and perhaps draw the boundaries of of that community. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, and there is, I'll, I'll leave, yeah, uh, three minutes before the end, I'll, I'll say one word about, um, about a, a new direction that was discovered about 15 years ago. And I think it's, it's pretty promising uh, element in terms of, of uh, reconstructing what really happened there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait, I'll try to pick a few more questions. So Martha, how do you determine which sources are credible in trying to figure out Spinoza's history? I try to figure, I try to use everything I have. So uh, when I have a text of the, uh, when I have the text of the band, then it's absolutely useful. I mean, uh, if I, I, I try to use any source, I'll try to see just where it is coming from. Uh, what are the beliefs of that person? Uh, and what is, when, how it was it constructed? But the interesting thing is that in Spinoza's own writing, we have almost no response to the to the Helen. Literally, I mean, there are some claims that perhaps one part, one chapter from the TTP yeah, was written in response to the Helen. But if you look just carefully at the text itself, Spinoza is saying nothing. Again, and moreover, again, if you look at the very end of the text, you see that he thinks that uh, the use of Helen, the use of excommunication, is, is legitimate. Um, okay, um, here's uh, from just another mode. Okay, that's nice. Uh, modes are for human beings for Spinoza are modes. So that's, uh, and the question is how widely were Spinoza's text read? Uh, was the biggest impact of communication the depth of the reception and the size of the audience uh, of his thought? So first of all, in the 18th century, it's not clear that Spinoza's texts were so much read. I mean, people were reading mostly uh, a text by a French scholar by the name of Pierre Bale, who wrote a beautiful, very impressive uh, entry on Spinoza in his dictionary um, in, 17, in 1699 and afterwards in 1703. So much of the myth about Spinoza, uh, at least in the 18th century, was the result of this text. 
Now, Spinoza has bizarre, or at least in certain contexts, pantheism, for example, in the Christian, at least Catholic context, uh, pantheism seems to be, uh, I mean, heresy or associated with atheism. In the Jewish context, it's not. In the rabbinic context, at least till the late 18th century, uh, panentheism and pantheism are just almost uh, the, the very basic principles of, I would say, half of all Kabbalists. So, um, um, Okay, uh, what's the biggest impact of excommunication, the depth of the reception? And well, of course, the story of the excommunication or of the chilem um, was, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. It's an interesting story. Uh, and it is drawing our attention to the story. There is also some tendency to build the story of Spinoza a little bit like the story of Christ. Spinoza himself actually begins that in one of his, um, in, the, in, in the preface to the TTP, there is one place where I think he's posing himself in kind of a side note as Christ. And so you'll see in 18th century literature sometimes uh, presentation of Spinoza as Christ being, well, these two guys were just uh, persecuted by the Pharisees. And, to some extent, there is something to that, but um, but again, the story, as far as I can see, is much more complicated. Uh, from Frank, what factors, social, political, economic, made up such a hotbed of Chelem? I, I, I think I mentioned that a minute ago. I, I think, you know, think about it. It's a new community trying to, I mean, their practices originally were some sort of mixture of Jewish tradition, Christian tradition, and now they're trying to define what precisely are they supposed to do, right? And so uh, they are learning, uh, they are, so they are hiring some of the uh, uh, rabbinic figures from other places in order to learn what they're supposed to be quite Jews. Um, but they need now to force people to accept these, um, these traditions and not being in this kind of limbo that they were living for the past century, century and a half. So the, the practice of harems precisely is, as far as I can see, uh, is an attempt to, um, to, um, to put some structure and, and try to um, organize uh, or, or try to uh, put lim uh, try to limit the, the, the limbo situation that is uh, present there. Uh, three minutes. Okay. So what is this new discovery 15 years? That, uh, so here's a work. I mean, I'm referring to two articles by a Dutch scholar named Dete Blessing. She filed an extraordinary document uh, dated about three months before uh, the ban on Spinoza. Well, here's the story. Uh, a year and a half or two years before, um, before the ban, um, Spinoza's father died. Uh, he, his father was a very wealthy merchant, uh, one of the uh, leaders of the community in Amsterdam. And um, uh, when he died, I mean, first Spinoza kept giving the regular donations to the community. And then it turned out that he stopped giving them. But what most important, that's not the issue. The real issue, it turned out that his father was well, a little bit like Donald Trump. I mean, he he appeared wealthy. Uh, he had huge amount of debt, of, of debts, I'm sorry. And uh, he had huge amount of debt. And when uh, all the amount of this kind of debt uh, turned out to, um, uh, to the public eye, Spinoza realized that uh, he cannot return. He, it's impossible for him to return this debt. So what did he do? Uh, he was 24 and a half years old. And uh, three months before the harem, he writes to the municipality in Amsterdam and asks them to recognize him as an orphan so that all the debts will be canceled. Now, the laws in Amsterdam were such that a person would be recognized as a minor till the age of 25. In the Jewish community, usually the, the age of adulthood would be either 18 or 21. So, where Spinoza, so what Spinoza was doing was basically uh, in, in this request to the uh, Amsterdam municipality, he was asking to cancel his debt and 
he also he was also asking to get a share from the inheritance of its father before the other debt collectors. Now, Odette Lessing claimed that this was uh, the reason for the ban because it was an act of disrespect towards the father. Uh, it's perhaps, but I think that there is something slightly else uh, happening here. I mean, perhaps it's an act of disrespect, but again, I'm not sure that disrespect towards parents is always a reason for bans, or we don't know, we, we don't have many evidence for, uh, for such actions motivating uh, Helen. What Spinoza did by acting, by uh, appealing to the, uh, appealing to the Amsterdam authority was just to break in the autonomy of the community. Uh, so in Jewish communities, usually when you have, uh, when you have some debate or you have some controversy about money, you go to the local or mini courts and there you, uh, you are, the, the issue is supposed to be decided. If the sides are not willing to agree according to the decision based on the courts, then they can appeal to the secular authorities. Now, when people are breaking the autonomy of the, of the, of the, of the community and are going to secular authorities frequently, and you have hundreds of cases of that, so they are put on ban. This is also happening right now in Israel. So if someone in their religious community, instead of just um, adjudicating his case in a religious court, will go to the Israeli court, Jewish, but secular court, he has a good chance of being uh, put on the ban because he's breaking the autonomy of the community. Now, am I sure about this? Absolutely not. I mean, we need text, we need the documents. As long as we're not going to have the documents, it's going to be only another speculation. Now, you know, if I if it were not these days of coronavirus, uh, I would have been precisely right now in Amsterdam digging um, documents in archives, trying to find precisely what happened there. Uh, well, you know, we cannot do that. I mean, for obvious reasons. But at least we had some time to discuss this issue, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.